so what I want to talk to you about is uh, data-driven uh, networked urbanism. And uh, I'm really have a look at what's been kind of going on really in this kind of urban big data space and how it's affecting how cities are kind of managed and controlled and regulated uh, and so on. Now, obviously, there's a very long history of uh, cities um, engaging with data and using data to understand uh, themselves. So, you know, urban data has been key input for understanding city life, for solving urban problems, for formulating policy plans, for guiding operational governance, modelling possible futures, and ta tackling a diverse set of, uh, of their issues. And so, really, as long as there's been uh, uh, data... Uh, as long as uh, there's been cities, really, there's been data generated about them, and that that data's been employed, and it's really kind of data-informed urbanism, if you like. Because um, often the data has a kind of a lag on it, and so on. Whereas what's kind of happening now is it's increasingly being complemented and replaced by data-driven networked urbanism, which has been driven through this kind of changing urban data landscape, where we've been moving from small to big data. And the big transformation really is real-time data, large, extensive, real-time uh, data sets, as opposed to delayed data sets such as a census, which might take 18 months before it uh, gets published, 18 to 24 months before it's published. So just so to my understanding of uh, big data, so you know where I'm, I'm coming from. So small data, um, so these are kind of the characteristics I think define a kind of big data on the, on the left-hand side. So traditionally it's been the three Vs, a volume, velocity, and variety. Whereas actually I think it's more, it's more than that. Um, so it's about having very large data sets. So the volume is, can be quite extensive. It's about entire populations. So this is not sample data. This is N equals all data. This is everybody on Twitter. It's every car on the road. It's every pedestrian on the footpath. It's not a sample of them. It's not a sample of a population. It's everybody who's captured by that particular instrument. Uh, it tends to be, have quite good resolution indexicality, which, which basically means it's very fine-grained data and it relates to individual people, objects, territories, transactions, and so on. So all of those things have unique identifiers, whether that's your uh, uh, certain kinds of codes attached to you, whether that's social security number or, or whatever it might be, or whether it's an RFID chip on, the, on, a, on an object as opposed to a, a barcode, which shows... You know, every bottle of shampoo has the same barcode. With an RFID chip, every bottle of shampoo has a unique code. Transactions like your banking codes all have unique codes, all your emails have unique codes, and so on. So this is very fine-grained uh, level data. It has strong relationality because it has those codes. You can connect them across different data sets and start to link together those data together. Take typically is fast, so this is data that's flowing in real time. Quite varied. Uh, so it can be unstructured data, it can be structured data, and it can be very flexible and scalable. So the system can kind of change on the fly. So, something, so some people might say the census is big, is big data, and it certainly has some of these characteristics, very large. It does try to be the entire population. It does have good resolution, uh, although the data released to us is aggregated. Uh, the relationality is quite strong. It has no velocity. It's once every five or ten years, another two years before you get hold of the data. It has no variety. It's 30 structured questions and it has no flexibility. Once those questions are set and the, and the process of doing the survey starts, you can't change the sampling framework, you can't change the questions, you can't do anything with them. Whereas someone like Google or Facebook are constantly changing the algorithms in the background and they're constantly running A-B tests uh, and so on. So when you go onto Google and you do a search and you go back on again in 10 minutes' time, it's not necessarily the same algorithm that's processing your request. It could have been tweaked in some kind of way. The same with uh, kind of Facebook. Um, and clearly, this is very different types of data to something like what Facebook, you know, what Facebook is dealing with. So Facebook is typically dealing with about 10 billion uh, messages a day, about 4.5 billion likes, about 350 million photo uploads per day. Okay? Walmart's trying to deal with a, a million customer tra transactions per hour. This is huge amounts of data coming at you in real uh, time. And this is now going on in cities. So we can look at different types of data, urban big data to do with cities. So we can have surveillance, which might be high-resolution digital uh, CCTV, might have facial recognition attached onto it, might have automatic number plate recognition attached onto it. About 30 million cars a day are ca captured by AM AMPR in the UK. And every day, 30 million cars, their number plates are scanned. 
uh, could be satellite or drone imagery, could be scale public administration records. Uh, so some public administration records are collected on, on, on a rolling basis. Uh, a directed, I mean, there's somebody still in charge of the, of the system. So this is somebody on the loop. So we can think of human in the loop, uh, sorry, on, in the loop, on the loop, and off the loop. Okay, so in the loop is they're still involved in the decision making and so on. On the loop is the system works independently of the person, but a person oversees the system and can intervene. And off the loop is the system has the autonomy just to get on and do what it's meant to do based on algorithms and so on. Okay. So automated is kind of on or off the, off the loop. Uh, obviously, lots of information off of automated surveillance, lots of stuff streaming off of digital devices. So the spy in your pocket, there's tons of data coming off of this, which I'll show you uh, later on. So this is streaming data, even though I'm not doing anything with it at the minute. It's sat there. If I've got a, a location-aware app on here, it's telling whoever that app is where I am about every four minutes. So all the way through this talk, it will be telling Vodafone and Facebook and Twitter where I am. Okay. Uh, we have all kinds of sensors and actuators and transponders and meters. So the Internet of Things embedded in our environments now collecting data, whether they're pollution sensors or sound sensors or whatever it might be. All kinds of interactions and transactions going on in and out of car parks and uh, buying different goods and services and so on. And then there's the information that we volunteer ourselves through social media like uh, Twitter and Facebook, uh, through surveillance and wearables. So surveillance is the kind of monitoring of, your, of yourself. So Fitbit and Nike Fuel Bar and collecting information about your, uh, how, uh, how your, kind of, uh, uh, your body is responding to the environments you're in and where you are and so on. Whether it's crowdsourcing of information like people going out and collecting uh, data and uploading it into OpenStreetMap or Wikipedia or whatever it might be. Or it could be citizen science where you might have your own weather station in your back garden that's collecting data that's then feeding that information into a, a site like Wonderground where you know, it's kind of crowdsourced uh, uh, weather data. Oops, sorry. And then we have a whole range of different entities who are generating this data. So both from public and private uh, generation uh, so we have utilities, so people in water, electricity, gas, uh, and so on, uh, who might be using kind of smart meters, to, and which you can also link into off of apps to using, to transport providers, things like Oyster cards and so on, scanning in and out of the system, uh, through to environmental agencies, mobile phone operators, social media sites, travel and accommodation websites, and things like TripAdvisor and so on, through to home appliances and entertainment systems, if you've got a smart TV, that's a two-way communication. They know what you're watching and so on, like there's, a, a, there's a, a, a communication going on. Whether it's financial institutions and retail chains, or credit card companies, banking financial institutions, whether it's uh, private surveillance and security firms, remote sensing aerial surveying, emergency services, and so on. So basically all of these kinds of entities, including local government, national government, are, are producing a kind of a data deluge, if you like, uh, that can be kind of combined and analysed and acted upon. And we're really at the kind of the start of this period of this kind of data. Um, and we're also, a lot of this data is, is obviously private and it's not in the public domain. It's quite difficult to get access uh, to it if you wanted to uh, use it in thinking about how you uh, run the city. Although companies are increasingly starting to try and sell that data back and there's a, bit, there's a data market around this. So, for example, a company like Uber is trying to sell some of its data to cities in America to look at doing transport modeling uh, and so on. We're also kind of moving from single systems. So this is like a kind of a transport, uh, data coming into transport. So if you ever see these kind of tire, tire circles on the road, they're transduction loops, and they're counting the cars basically going across. There's normally a box hidden in a hedge at the side uh, that communicates the data back to a central control room. Also getting data from... Uh, uh, cameras, also getting data from uh, sensors, uh, might be getting data from social media, so from Twitter and, uh, and so on, feeding data back into the traffic management system. And of course, al although this is typically shared, your car itself is, a, is, a, is effectively a computer on wheels. It's about 40 computers on the average car, generating all kinds of data, uh, which is why when you go and get it fixed, they plug a computer in and start looking at the, the diagnostics on it. What's happening there with those single systems, though, is they're starting to be brought together. 
So if you can imagine that, you know, you've got your transport system, you've got your energy system, you've got your water system, you've got your whatever, whatever it is within the city, your planning data and so on, they're starting to be brought together and more integrated. Okay, so trying to kind of break down these data silos and marry up the data. So these are four city operating systems. And so, you know, we have our operating systems for these. This is a, a notion of an operating system for a city. So this is IBM's Intelligence Operations Center. Um, this is uh, Microsoft's City Next. This is Obotica's urban operating, uh, city operating system, and this is Living Planet's urban operating system. And that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to provide a way of linking through, connecting through the various uh, data sets and join, join up the kind of, uh, join them up so you can kind of get more effective, uh, more efficient uh, city uh, management, city uh, governance. And that's leading to these kinds of rooms. So I'm sure Plymouth has got one of these rooms somewhere that's doing a uh, traffic management system. I can actually guarantee you, you can laugh, but I can guarantee you there's one of these rooms in the city. <laughs> Sorry? They just spent 800,000 pounds making a room. Did they? Yep. Okay, so this is the one in Rio, which is the kind of the famous one. Uh, it's a city centre that's pulling in real-time data from 30 different agencies across the city. Uh, it's merging it together with other kinds of uh, public administration data. And they're trying to run, basically run city infrastructure from here. So it's put in basically for the Olympics, the Federation Cup, the World Cup as a way of trying to manage uh, the urban services. Pulling in data from weather, emergency services, transport, uh, and so on. Uh, this is... Um, Oh, I've forgotten where they are now. This is uh, Sydney, I think. This is a uh, city in Japan, Kawasaki, I think. You can quite see he's got quite detailed analytics up on here. Uh, and this is, actually a uh, this is actually a control room for a single road. This is the control room for the M25. This is what it, this is what it takes to make traffic flow around the M25 on a daily basis. Okay, so it's pulling in tons of different data from uh, sensors and cameras and so on try and get that system to keep moving. And basically, w what we have here is a huge amount of data, and what's going on are people now trying to work out, well, how do you deal with this data deluge? How do you make sense of it? If you've got this much data coming in, what do you, what do, you do with it? So uh, the solution to it really is data analytics, and um, where you're really relying on uh, kind of machine learning, which is basically artificial intelligence techniques, uh, to, try and uh, to try and spot patterns within the data, to mine out information from it, uh, to do kind of da data visualization and visual analytics, applying uh, kind of traditional statistical techniques on the data, but also come up with new statistical techniques. One of the problems with stats is that they were, our traditional stats were designed to try and extract value from small data sets, okay, where you had quite tightly controlled uh, samples and then scale up, whereas we actually have N equals all data sets, and we probably need a different way of trying to uh, uh, look at the, uh, the patterns within it from a statistical basis. And then a lot of stuff around kind of prediction, simulation, and optimization. So, you know, can we, off of this data, can we predict what's going to happen in the, in the future? Uh, can we kind of simulate how a city runs? Can we optimize the traffic flow? Uh, and so on. And with respect to urban studies, it's going to lead into the development of the field called urban informatics, which is really a kind of informational human computing interaction approach um, to, to the cities and also to urban science which is a much more kind of computational modeling kind of approach which is kind of trying to take kind of GIS, geocomp, uh, data science and kind of social physics. And actually a lot of people working in this space are not, are not geographers, they're physicists and mathematicians and computer scientists and so on who kind of discovered uh, geography. And it's leading to these kinds of uh, uh, kind of systems that's kind of pu pushing out some of the data back towards uh, uh, citizens. So these are really kind of urban informatics, I guess, kind of inspired things. So this one is the uh, Dublin dashboard. This is the one that uh, myself and one of my postdocs has built for uh, Dublin. It's pulling in all the data that we can get for Dublin from, uh, from any kind of public uh, source, so from... Uh, state agencies, central statistics office, government departments, local authorities, uh, and so on. And we've, uh, we've been able to leverage out and open up data, uh, new data sets uh, from them. It kind of has a kind of an overview. Kind of has a, how's the Dublin uh, doing on its economy, on its health, on its transport, and so on. 
where we're trying to get sub-annual data sets, so data that's released monthly or quarterly, uh, half yearly or whatever. It also has a whole load of real-time data, so we know where all the buses are, where all the trains are, where all the trams are. We know how many spaces are in the car parks. We know what the road speeds are on the road segments. We know how many cars are going through each junction uh, in the city. We know what the weather sensors are doing. We know what the pollution sensors are saying. We know what the noise sensors are saying, and so on. And this is all outputted uh, through there. We have a whole series of map data, so all the census data, and all the bits of public administration data, all the planning data, and uh, county development plan data all kind of like local service data. So in here you can kind of look at, well, where's, where are all the post offices? Where's the nearest one to me? What's its opening hours? What does it look like on Google Street View or whatever? Whole series of housing data. Again, working with the local authorities to get the housing data out. Dublin reporting is you can crowdsource in. So you can kind of take a photo and say, there's a pothole here or there's graffiti here and so on. And it uploads into the city's CRM system, so Customer Relation Management System which then directly flows into their workflow system, and they have kind of seven days, whatever it is, to go and fix it. This is where you get all the data. So all of this data is now open data. It's publicly available data. There's nothing in here that the city gets that citizens don't get. So everything the city's getting, the citizens are getting. That's the kind of the, uh, the premise on here. And then this is the stuff that we would like to do, but I uh, haven't got around to doing yet. This is one for London, which is slightly different. It's a, it's, a, it's a single screen. This is an analytic dashboard. It's got lots of different levels in it. You can go up and down. This is just at a glance, single screen, single snapshot of what's going on in London. This is one that's been developed for uh, Amsterdam uh, and so on. Okay, so hopefully I've persuaded you that there's something going on with, in cities and in relation to data, and there's lots of stuff kind of happening there. You know, cities are becoming ever more interrelated, networked, uh, and their systems are becoming interlinked and integrated. And then consequently, I think that we can say cities are becoming knowable and controllable in new dynamic ways. Um, and urban operational governments and city uh, services are becoming highly responsive to a form of networked urbanism in which the, these kind of big data systems are kind of prefiguring and setting the urban agenda. They're producing a deluge of contextual and actionable data and they're influencing and controlling how city systems respond and perform uh, in real time. Okay, some level that all sounds great, but is there a dark side to this stuff? Okay, so this all fits within this kind of smart cities uh, kind of narrative. You know, data driven network tourism, in a way, is what underpins the kind of formation of particular kinds of smart cities, smart cities that are driven by this kind of instrumented and uh, networked uh, kind of form of urbanism. There's other kinds of smart cities, of course, which are related around entrepreneurship and innovation and creativity and economic development and so on. And there's other kinds where you can vision them as being kind of more bottom-up participation, transparency, openness, uh, civic engagement and so on. Um, but really the critique around uh, smart cities is it, it kind of positions the city as being this kind of knowable, rational, sorry, rational, steerable system. I can take my data levers and I can kind of take my data and pull my levers and kind of steer, steer this city in the same way I might control an aeroplane based on the data feedbacks. Okay? Whereas we all know that cities are really complicated, multi-level uh, uh, places full of vested interests and competition and resistance and transgression, all kinds of stuff, right? You can't just take the data and pull the levers and the city kind of goes in the direction uh, that you want. It also kind of positions them as being quite ahistorical, aspatial and homogenizing, and a lot of this technology and ideas, uh, you know, the idea you can kind of transpose them onto any city, you know, kind of denying that they've got their own culture and their own politics and their own governance and their own history and their own way of doing things and ways of operating and so on does kind of promote a very kind of technocratic form of governance as opposed to a kind of deliberative form of uh, governance. And it forwards the notion of solutionism, which is this idea that you can kind of fix any problem through the application of technology as, a through, as opposed to through policy or through politics or through some other kind of uh, uh, way of trying to tackle problems. There's also the potential around corporatization of, of governance. Most of the competence needed to do this doesn't exist inside of cities at the minute. And so there's a lot of public-private partnerships go on with 
with private companies to bring that expertise and knowledge into the system. So what does it mean if you kind of start to corporatize or privatize uh, city uh, services? Um, that they kind of serve certain interests and they reinforce uh, particular inequalities. So a lot of these uh, systems uh, tend to uh, serve the middle classes or the upper classes and they pu push a particular agenda. And in places like India and so on, it's very, where it's very clearly part of a kind of a national development project, if you kind of look at some of their plans, you know, there's no slums in any of these new cities and people are being dispossessed of their land with no compensation uh, and so on. And then I just want to focus on these three at the bottom, the kind of the politics around urban data, uh, which is really around this notion that the data isn't kind of neutral and value-free and non-ideological and so on, that, the, that there's a kind of whole politics around uh, these data sets, that they have social, political and ethical effects. And they also potentially create cities that are quite buggy and brittle and hackable. Um, you know, so this kind of big data and these dashboards aren't simply technical tools. The data that's being produced doesn't exist independently of ideas, of instruments, of practices, of context, knowledges, and the systems kind of used to generate, process, and analyze them. There's all kinds of choices going on here about what data we do and we don't collect, how we collect that data, how we analyze that data, who we share it with, how we marketize it, what else we might do with it, uh, and so on. And the way I've been thinking around this is, is in a relation to trying to unpack a kind of a, a kind of see, see these systems as kind of socio-technical assemblages and how we might unpack them. So if we were to take something like the Dublin uh, dashboard, we can kind of understand it as having a kind of a, te a technical kind of stack, if you like, you know, where we have the kind of infrastructure and hardware and then we have an operating system and a database and software and interfaces and so on. And it's how that all works together is roughly how this ends, you know, the screen ends up uh, kind of working. But that all happens within a context of systems of thought, so ideas and knowledge and, uh, and so on, philosophy, uh, various kinds of practices, kind of data practices, software practices and so on. The finance that actually underpins that. One of the big problems around smart cities is it's how do you finance it when all the cities are in austerity? Where does the money come from to implement a lot of these kinds of systems? And then based on that finance, how does that push certain kinds of arrangements and so on? The various political economies, various kind of governmentalities and legalities, so things like data standards, protocols, uh, law, data protection, uh, and so on. How kind of organizations interact, subjectivities, marketplace places, and so on. So there's a kind of a swirl going on here. This is not a, pro a pragmatic, commonsensical, neutral system. It's a system that has all kinds of things involved in it, politics, economic, social, and so on, as well as all kinds of technical uh, choices. There's nothing inevitable about any of this. So these kind of big data and these dashboards express a kind of a normative notion of what should be measured, for what reasons, and what they should tell us. And they also have a normative effect being used to influence decision-making, modify institutional behavior, condition workers, socially sought people, predictively profile people, introduce new forms of anticipatory governance, predictive policing, uh, and so on. So these two data and tools are never objective and neutral, and nor can the data speak for themselves. There's always people involved in the interpretation of the data, uh, and so on. The second is there's a whole series of kind of ethics around uh, this kind of stuff. So um, another kind of question is around data ownership and data control. Who owns the data? So it's an interesting talk by uh, Dan Byers, who was the Minister for Smart Cities, but he was bemoaning the fact that in British cities they don't have some of their key data sets. They don't have energy data sets. They have limited transport data sets. Basically, they don't have anything they've privatised. When they privatise the utilities and privatise, they privatise the data. Okay, so if you want to do key modelling around energy consumption in cities, you have to go and beg the data off those companies. Okay, because when they did the when they did the privatisation or the procurement, they didn't factor in around the data. And I know that from uh, other cities where they. Uh, done things like procured shared bike schemes and actually in the process privatised the data. So they don't, they don't have data about the bike share scheme in their city even though it's run by them and so on. Uh, there's all kinds of issues around data integration and data markets about how, how some of this data might end up on secondary markets that are then, that are then sold. So we have these new multi-billion dollar uh, data markets operating 
that are kind of profiling us, predictively profiling us, and making decisions about whether we get the job, or whether we get the loan, or whether we get the tenancy, or whether we get the mortgage, uh, and so on. Whereas those issues around data security and integrity, which we'll come back to, when we come back to data protection privacy, we don't, data policy and data problems, we don't know a lot around this. Uh, a lot of this data is published without anything around kind of error rates, calibration rates, anything around the provenance of the data, uh, and so on. So the real question is around how much we can kind of trust the data. We know a lot of it is quite uh, um, uh, messy and noisy, but we don't know to what extent. So there's big issues around some of this, and there's obviously issues around the data use. And I'm going to focus mostly on uh, the basis of uh, this report, which was published uh, last week. Um, this is a report I wrote for the Department of the Taoiseach, which is the Prime Minister's office in Ireland, around kind of uh, data privacy and uh, data security on the basis of these uh, smart cities. So there are all kinds of privacy debates that come off of this, uh, come off of this uh, data, and we have to kind of understand that privacy is a kind of a multi-dimensional concept, which we often forget. We kind of just talk about privacy without kind of saying, well, unpicking what do we really mean? So we can kind of think about identity privacy, which is kind of protect your personal confidential data, your bodily privacy, to protect the physical integrity of the body, territorial privacy to protect uh, personal space and property, locational movement uh, privacy, so tracking of your spatial behaviour, your communications privacy, protecting the surveillance of your correspondence and your conversations, and transactions privacy, kind of monitoring of your queries and searches and purchases and other exchanges. And really within a smart city, a lot of these are being infringed in different ways and are causing what are called privacy uh, harm. So these are a, a kind of a list of privacy harms. I'm not going to dwell on this. But just to point out there's various different types of, uh, of uh, breaches from surveillance through to interrogation to aggregation, identification, insecurity, secondary use, exclusion, a breach of confidentiality or disclosure, which is often what we think of as a privacy or exposure, or increased accessibility, or blackmail, or appropriation, or distortion, intrusion, decisional interference. So you can maybe even start to think about how these various kinds of forms of data that are coming off all those different types of systems, whether they're cameras or sensors or whatever it might be, might potentially lead to these kinds of uh, security breaches. And I'm going to illustrate a couple of those in a in a minute. So. The argument is, is a lot of this, what, what we're experiencing is kind of an intensification of datafication. All kind of aspects of our everyday lives now are being, are being collected and monitored through various kinds of systems. Not everything, but if anything that kind of involves some kind of digital device or digital transaction, or if you're walking around the street up there, I'm sure you're on lots of different uh, cameras and so on. <clears throat> So if we think about that in relation to location and movement, it used to be, say, 30 years ago, you could move around in a crowd pretty much anonymously. The only way somebody would be able to know all your location and movements is if I hired somebody to follow you, which is obviously quite time and uh, intensive and would cost me a lot of money. Whereas now our kind of location is tracked uh, in lots of different ways almost continuously. So we have controllable <coughs> digital CCTV cameras, that might have AMPR or might have facial recognition. There's a few different cities in Britain experiments with facial recognition. Lots of cities in the US have facial recognition on their cameras. Uh, smartphones, so we can be tracked by three different ways, via the cell mast that the phone connects to, by the GPS in the, in the phone itself, and by the Wi-Fi networks that the phone tries to connect to as it, as it moves around. Uh, the sensor networks, so again, what they're doing, trying, typically trying to do is pull information off your phone. So what they're trying to do is uh, ping off your MAC address off your phone. So the famous example really is the, uh, the one in London where there was a network of 200 bins uh, where they installed sensors on them. And in a one week period, it captured 4 million unique phones and tracked them from bin to bin and from shop to shop. So they knew where you'd been, how long you'd been in the store, what route you were taking across the city, and so on. Now they were trying to do that for contextual advertising, so there's LED screens on the bin, and they would know that as you approached, you know, for me, they might put up McDonald's, for you, they might put up Marks and Spencer's, for you, they might put up whatever, but based on where I've been, they would try and target me with advertising. 
Wi-Fi mesh work is, say, you've got like a Wi-Fi system across the city, like a public Wi-Fi system. Again, if you've got Wi-Fi turned on your phone, your phone will try to connect to whatever wireless networks are around it. So again, it can identify you as you go from Wi-Fi point to Wi-Fi point. Smart card tracking are things like your Oyster card or your swipe card to get in and out of these buildings in here if you, if you have that kind of security here. So every time you kind of swipe across stuff, it knows uh, where you're going. going. Most vehicles now have uh, unique ID codes and transponders on them. Um, I mean, I have one of mine to go through toll booths. You know, I don't stop at the toll booths and pay the money. I have a little transponder on and it beeps and my money's automatically discounted. So it knows where I'm going through toll booths. It knows which car parks I'm going into because you do the same with car parks. And there's all other kinds of staging points, one-off things, so ATM machines, credit card use, uh, and so on. And then there are very specific schemes like electronic tagging, where you tag, say, a sexual offender with a, with a GPS bracelet or whatever. Or you could tag your kids, a lot of people tag their kids in there. Uh, or, you, or sharing calendars, if you share calendars on Google or whatever else, you've told Google exactly where you're going to be. Google know where you're going to be. Right? So there's lots of different ways we're either sharing the information voluntarily or it's being picked up of us. But what it does mean is we're no longer lost in the crowd. You know, we can find people, particularly if they've got these smartphones and they haven't turned all the different settings up. And then this is just what comes off your phone. So this is the permissions that an Android app uh, uh, looks for, typically looks for. Some, some app people will narrow these down, but this is the, the full suite. So if you have a, an Android app on your, on your phone, it can get your email log, it can get your app activity, it can get your device info, it can get your GPS, uh, it can get your phone logs, your messaging logs, it can, it can get the Wi-Fi, things you've got to do. It can even get your battery temperature. So if I have a taxi app on here, I have no idea why they need to know my battery temperature. Why do they need to know that? That's not a vital part of the service as far as I can see. Okay. But they can call lots of, in fact, knowing who I've done text messages with seems completely irrelevant as well. So this is open as opposed to closed. This is privacy is completely open as opposed to privacy by design being closed. Okay. This, this is like the default open settings. And then all that kind of data can be used to make all kinds of inferences uh, uh, about us and to kind of create predictive uh, profiling, and, predict and then which kind of opens up all kinds of predictive privacy harms. Uh, the, the most of those really is around kind of anticipatory uh, governance uh, so anticipated governance is really within, uh, you know, it's minority report and it's within predictive policing and it is going on within, uh, certainly within some uh, US cities like Chicago and New York and so on. They're trying to identify where they think crimes will happen and they're trying to identify who will commit. Uh, there's all kinds of issues around weak anon uh, uh, anonymization and re-identification. So a lot of this data, the companies would argue, is anonymous and so on, but actually it's relatively straightforward to re-identify in certain cases. And there's now companies who actually offer re-identification uh, services. Uh, the kind of the opacity and the automation kind of creates uh, obfuscation and we kind of reduces control. So you don't often know what's going on uh, around, around you. Uh, well, the data has been kind of shared and repurposed in all kinds of ways and used in unpredictable and unexpected ways. Most people don't realise when they're given over their data for this service that it might be used for all these other things and actually might be used against them in terms of credit ratings and so on. And then notice and consent tends to be a kind of an empty exercise or is, or is absent. Okay, so this is really the case within... I mean, so often the case with these, about a third of all apps on a, on a, on a smartphone, whether it's Android or, or Apple, don't have any privacy or don't have any terms and conditions. I don't really have any notice of consent. Uh, and it's certainly the case when I go around the city, like the, if a bin has got a sensor on it and it's pulling my Mac address, it, there's no notice of consent. It hasn't asked me or told me. I haven't consented to that. It's just, if my license plate is taken, it's just taken me. If the CCTV takes my face, it's just taken. Nobody's asking me. I'm not ticking a, a consent form. Okay? But there's no way around it, right? I can't exist in the city without being within, uh, captured by these various uh, systems. So what that basically means is that these kind of fair information practice principles, which are the key principles underpinning data protection law, uh, 
start to become redundant in this big data age, with all the kind of hassle going on in the EU, in the EU around uh, data protection, revised data protection is, is because of this. And we're not quite sure how to uh, deal with it. So the ones in red and orange are the ones in the FTC in the US. So the OCD originally uh, advocated eight of these. Uh, they've reduced them down as well. Yeah. The, um, FTC have reduced them down even, even uh, further. But these are kind of meant to exist. And one, one of the ones you'll see there is um, uh, data, data minimization. So one of the principles underpinning uh, how we use data in the, in the EU is data are only used for the purpose for which they are generated, and individuals are informed of each change of purpose. Well, that's not going on. Okay. Big data is actually the opposite of that. Big data is all, is all about repurposing, uh, selling, sharing, doing other things with. It's not about data minimization. It's not about using the data for a single purpose. It's about how you can leverage it off and do other interesting uh, things uh, with it. And also, I've just said notice of consent, we're also under pressure. Access is very difficult. It's very difficult to even know who to go and ask to find out what data they hold about you. If you don't know they've collected the data in the first place, how can you do that, right? And then there's this issue around kind of hacking of cities and uh, data security, which I'm starting to get interested in. So can you, can you now hack the city? So anything that's got software in and is networked, you can hack, okay? And then there are now examples of people hacking bits of city infrastructure, things like hacking traffic light management systems, Hacking sewage control systems and letting out sewage into water supply. Hacking electricity grid and turning off the electricity uh, and so on. And the two, this kind of data security and operational security become, become interlinked. So one of the ways you can, get to, um, you can get to the data is by hacking something else. So when one of the large uh, consumer companies in the US was hacked and 100 million records were stolen, the way in was actually through the heating and air conditioning system. That was the, the route through. So poor security on that system and then poor data segmentation of inside allowed people to get, to get through. And all kinds of stuff are being hacked now. So cars are being hacked. Uh, and uh, there was an example recently last year um, of a car being hacked and with a wired journalist in it where the, where the two people that hacked basically just drove him off the moment, drove him off the freeway. He had no control over the steering, the brakes, nothing. They took over the entire car from, from 10 miles away. Right, so really interesting things going on around kind of hacking systems. Now basically there's all kinds of issues around weak security and encryption. So things like the Internet of Things typically has quite weak encryption. Very difficult to get end-to-end -end because at one end it's very low power source, so it's very quite difficult to get the encryption off. There's all kinds of issues around legacy systems. You can find old bits of city technology that's running on Windows XP, running on Windows NT, running on stuff, you know, um, and very poorly maintained. Got the original settings, so the original manufacturer's password from 1983 is still the password now, kind of stuff. Uh, you have very large, complex attack services and interdependencies. So there's lots of different points along the system where you could, where you can try and formulate it. So you. If you knock together your silos to create this, these integrated systems, then you can get all kinds of interesting cascade effects. So all those uh, kind of city operating systems I showed you at the beginning, which is all about interlinking, one of the key ways you have security is to have silos. You don't want somebody to be able to get into your water system and then also be able to take over your electricity and then also be able to take over your traffic lights and then also be able to, you want to be able to contain the problem within a certain uh, space, but you could potentially create all kinds of cascade effects. And then, of course, there's obviously human error and uh, disgruntled employees can uh, kind of come into the, come into the mix. But what's, what does it mean if you can get a city that can be hacked? You know? Okay, so what I was asked to do in this report for the TSHIX department was to set up all the various kind of privacy and security things and then come up with some solutions. So these were my Solutions. I thought I'd end up my solutions, so, so we might be able to deal with some of this. Um, but I was asked to stay away from legislation, be, mainly because that's an EU competency, not a national level competency. Ireland doesn't set the data protection laws, the, the EU does, right? 
Um, so there are essentially market solutions, which are kind of industry standards, self-regulation, but also people actually seeing privacy and security as a competitive advantage, actually selling that as part of the service. Your data will be more secure with us than it is with somebody else. Uh, we won't sell your data, whatever it might be. There's obviously technological solutions, which is stronger end-to-end -end encryption, access control, security controls, trails, backups, and so on. There's also privacy enhancement uh, tools. On the policy and regulation side, there is actually trying to come up with a new set of fair information practice principles fit for the big data age. And there's also insisting on things like uh, privacy by design and security by design. So they basically mean you build them in at the get-go. So you don't build your system and then try to work out how you're going to make it private. You don't build your system and then try to work out how you're going to secure it. You start from the very start of the design phase, working out how you're going to build them into the, into the system. And then there's also kind of, and also there's kind of education and training programs where you kind of tell people what's going on and what they can kind of do about it. And then there's kind of governance things. So my, my feeling here is, is that it's incumbent on the cities to kind of look at what data is being collected about their citizens and to uh, be very careful about how they manage that uh, kind of process and, uh, and, uh, and kind of what's happening with different uh, technologies and so on. So I think there is a kind of a need for a kind of a multi-level set of governance such as you know, city advisory boards that focus on city strategy and so on. But there is actually kind of oversight of uh, delivery and compliance. So kind of smart city governance risk uh, ethics boards and so on um, that, that meet actually fairly regularly, like quarterly or once a month and so on, actually see what's going on. So, so I'm, I, I do this at the minute for the National Statistics Agency uh, and so I get to see all of their various procedures about how they try to manage the data they're collecting, how they try to uh, do their storage, what happens with the data and so on. And it's the same kind of this, the idea here that there would actually be a core privacy security team within, within the city that goes around various departments, does privacy impact assessments and make sure that stuff happens and that there is a community emergency response team which basically means if somebody hacks your city there's a group of people who know how to try and uh, undo the problem and fix the problem. At the minute, that's oft often really uncoordinated and nobody really knows quite what to do. Mm -hmm. in, in a country the size of Ireland, that's really probably a national level initiative rather than each city. Particularly given our cities are small, 200, 100,000 people to have that. But if you had a national one that was shared between them, it would make, it would make uh, some sense. So to conclude, um, Basically, my argument is we're entering an era of embedded and mobile computation, but these kind of devices and infrastructure are producing uh, vast quantities of data now in real time. Uh, the city is responsive to that data, or increasingly responsive to that data, and it's enabling new kinds of monitoring and regulation and control. So cities are becoming uh, data-driven rather than uh, data-informed, and they're enacting new forms of algorithmic uh, governance that we're only just starting to get a, a handle on, really. And while the data-driven network urbanism does provide a, a set of solutions for various problems, it also does raise a whole series of uh, ethical and norm normative questions about what kinds of cities we want to uh, live in. And really the challenge facing urban managers and citizens is to realise the benefits of planning and delivering city services using uh, kind of urban big data whilst trying to minimise those pernicious effects. But network urbanism is not going to go away because it does offer... Uh, uh, cities uh, ways of uh, more effectively and efficiently managing their, uh, their city services. So the question then is, well, how, how do we want them to go about, uh, go about doing that and how can we minimise any negative effects out of that, such as widening inequalities or privacy or uh, surveillance effects? And I don't think there's really been very little thought on, on the latter bit, which is partly what my, my report was uh, trying to do. Uh, and I'll end that. Thanks.